This will be the first of two discussions on individualism and 20th century American art. Because this is such a broad topic, we will have to be selective in the art that we discuss. I cannot hope to hit on every example of American art that deals with the conflict of individualism and community. I also do not want to suggest that the conflict between the individual and community is the only issue at work in American art. I do hope that the discussion will be broad enough to show you an interesting diversity of ways in which artists can be seen as engaging with the concepts of individualism and the community. I also hope to demonstrate that viewing art through this lens can be a productive and a thought-provoking interpretive method. My progression will largely be historical and chronological. Because this lecture is particularly about art, I would encourage you to watch the lecture in full screen. I would also encourage you to pause the slideshow any time that is convenient for you. The show can easily be paused and resumed to allow you to more fully explore the artwork depicted. In the interest of time and file size, I will show the artwork only briefly and allow you to pause as you find useful. Because this historical survey is longer in duration than most lectures of this course, I have divided it into two sections. We left off our last discussion of Transcendentalist philosophy by talking about the relationship of the ideals of the Transcendentalist philosophers to 19th century landscape paintings. You will recall that for the Transcendentalist philosophers, human beings ought to be independent. The one dependency that was acceptable is the dependency upon nature, the divine teacher. We saw in the romantic ideals of the landscape painters, such as Thomas Cole, a similar focus on moving humans inward to focus on human drama and to find meaning through a focus on one's own individual experience. In some ways, this romantic ideal of the rugged individualist artist, focused completely inwardly on his or her own experience, is an idea that is still with us today. In the late 19th century, as the country continues to develop and industrialize, we see a developing awareness in artists of the importance of collective enterprises. Iron Workers' Noontime by Thomas Pollock Anschutz develops this trend. This image is about humans working together as they develop American industry. Another important event that turned Americans outward to focus on grand collective visions was the Chicago World's Fair or Columbian Exhibition of 1893. The organizers of the fair attempted to establish a collective American identity as they worked to show America as a powerful nation unified in its diversity. This image here shows some of the buildings bridges, statues, and canals that were built in particular for this exhibition. Of course, this type of artistic endeavor is necessarily about a group. Something of this scale and diversity simply cannot be created by an individual. A huge number of people have to work together to achieve such a thing. This time is also known as the Gilded Age, a reflection of the tendency for ornament and displays of wealth, often known as the Gilded Age, a reflection of the tendency for ornament and displays of wealth. But the wealth displayed in the Gilded Age involved important contradictions. While wealth was conspicuously displayed throughout the city, ironically, the average worker involved in creating this great collective art was himself likely to be a poor 
and disadvantaged person. During this time, the so-called robber barons ruled the Chicago economy. In fact, many of these same wealthy patrons were involved in sponsoring the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. These wealthy robber barons created monopolies in important sectors of business, development, and trade. As a result, they generated vast wealth for themselves and those with power and influence. But they also used their power to force the poor to work for low wages and in poor conditions. You will remember our discussion of Upton Sinclair's jungle and the conditions at the Chicago meatpacking plants. Interestingly, artwork during this era rarely showed the oppression of workers, but instead showed industrialization and development in positive terms or ignored it altogether. We might rightly say that during this period there was a tendency to focus on the community and our collective goals. But at the same time, the real oppressed status of most people within the community was frequently ignored by artists, who chose instead to focus on ideal visions of what America could be. Mary Cassatt's Modern Woman, which was painted as a mural on a building built for the fair, exemplifies many of these trends. Notice how the gritty working environment in Chicago factories at the turn of the century is ignored, and instead the, quote, modern women are seen picking apples in an idyllic apple orchard. We might delve deeper into the symbolism of the image and see the apples as standing for knowledge that the women were seeking together to attain. But even this view of women's education seems naive when juxtaposed with the hard work long hours, low pay, and poor education experienced by most women in a rapidly industrializing America of the late 19th century. This next image, another panel from Mary Cassatt's same work, displays the life of women in an even more idyllic setting, one that would be foreign to women working in a Chicago factory. Let's return to this image by Thomas Pollock Anschutz. We can tell from this picture that work is hard, but overall the figure stands strong, tall, muscular, and unbowed by the weight of their labor. We know the toil is tough, but the workers are proud. They do show self-reliance, but notice that most of the figures are actually in complex interrelation with each other, even during their break time. I think the underlying optimism of this image can be brought out if we look at the way the image could be so easily adapted to an advertising campaign. Everything here is a bit cleaner, but many of the basic forms, shapes, and images remain, and this image is meant particularly to market strong, proud, masculine men in close interrelationships. Still, this seeming partnership between art and industry in promoting an ideal sense of American progress was not to last forever. Over time, artists began to show an increased desire for realism. This realism was still often about the group, but these artists did not shy away from depicting increased industrial problems, nor from depicting the challenges brought on by industrial life. Both Members of This Club by George Bellows is a good example of this kind of social realism. Here our figures are not so proud, and the audience, ultimately those responsible for what goes on in the ring, are painted with inhuman, almost ghoul-like faces. We, we ask ourselves, who are the members of this club? Is it the man with dark skin? and the man with light skin, who are both members of the oppressed working class society with no choice but to fight for the pleasure of the audience? Is it the audience and the fighters 
who are both members of the same club, showing their causal responsibility and direct relationship with what goes on in the ring. Or is it we, the viewer of the work and the audience depicted watching the boxing, who are members of the same club? Perhaps in that those who are wealthy enough to enjoy art do so on the shoulders of oppressed working class people, just like those who enjoy boxing are doing so on the shoulders of the poor working class people who are in the ring. Compare these two images of collective masculinity. Both are certainly about the group and focus on group identity, but both with a very different message. This next image is another good example of social realism. A sense of frenetic movement replaces a sense of rationally governed social development. Perspectives overlap and conflict. A sense of busyness and almost disorder is apparent. We might contrast this scene with the idyllic town created from scratch for the Chicago World's Fair and then destroyed a few years later. Notice the broad boulevards, the rationally laid out plan and the sense of order and rationality guiding the social space in the first image. Implicit in the second image is a critique of those ideals about the kind of life that would be created by industry, wealth, and culture developed through the Industrial Revolution. Here is a last social realist image that I would like to contrast with the work done just before the turn of the century. Notice the way that Joan Sloan's A Woman's Work from 1912 contrasts with Mary Cassatt's idealistic vision of the status of the modern woman. I won't go deeper into this comparison now because I would like to have you do this analysis as a class project. For now, Notice some of the distinctions in the ideas about what kind of life, quote, modern living has brought for the American woman. The image from our last slide was from 1912. By 1914, World War I had already begun. During times of war, artists often come together to fight for the same cause, putting issues of community at the forefront of their artistic concerns. Of course, some will also use their art to rebel against the cause of war, though often with the same collective social concerns. It was not long after World War I that the Great Depression began in America. During this time of poverty, job loss, and economic suffering, Many artists turned their concerns to the community in a new way. Interestingly, many artists again began to see industry as the way to get us out of economic depression and to solve social ills. Industry was again championed in a way similar to that shown in the art before 1900, but contemporary artists were also aware of the potential oppressive power of industry. Many of these traits can be seen in Construction of a Dam from 1939. Notice how the men stand straight and tall, but how the angles and tension also leave a feeling of danger within the work. Also notice the racial message. Notice the racial message as well. Here we have people of very diverse backgrounds working together to bring America out of that economic turmoil. Diego Rivera was a Mexican muralist, 
but still one of the most influential muralists at work during this time. This image is entitled Detroit Industry. It was commissioned by Edsel Ford of Ford Motors and installed at the Detroit Institute of the Arts. What kinds of ideas about industry do you see presented here? How do you see humans and machines interrelating? How do you see the complex layers of images relating to each other? I hope you can see many of the complex ideas about the need for industry and the desire to protect workers from becoming oppressed automata within this work. I encourage you to pause here and spend some time analyzing the image. This is the second image from that same series. This one presented on the north as opposed to the south wall. This is another inspirational mural created by Diego Rivera in America during the Depression era. This one can be found in downtown San Francisco at the San Francisco Art Institute. This mural especially brings out the sense of the muralist that community enterprise is essential to progress, while at the same time being careful to preserve the integrity of the individual worker. In fact, while the workers are working together to create inspiring images of industry, notice what we find as the pinnacle of their creation. It is not great construction for the sake of construction like we saw at the Chicago World's Fair. Instead, standing above all else, the pinnacle of this collective project is the working man himself, standing proudly above the symbols of industry and seeming to reach out even beyond the frame itself. The government also put people to work in an effort to fight poverty. The images in San Francisco's Coit Tower are an example of government-commissioned art in an attempt to raise morale. Here again, there is no shying away from the hard work involved in agriculture, but there is also an uplifting community message about the value and dignity of work. Photographers also put their art to work to bring to light the suffering of the Great Depression. A famous example of such art is the series of images taken by Dorothea Lange at the migrant worker camps. This is one of a famous series of images taken of a migrant mother at a camp in Napomo, California. Spend some time looking at this image and ask yourself why is it so powerful at communicating both the reality of suffering and the need for compassion. This ends part one of our investigation into 20th century American art as seen through the lens of individualism and community. In the latter half of the 20th century, we will observe the ways in which individualism reasserts itself as a dominant theme in artistic expression.